The next panel session that we have is um, with uh, Hattie Hartman. Um, sustain oh, Hattie, well, you can introduce yourself better, but Hattie comes to us from, from London and writes for the AJ, but also hosts a wonderful podcast, Climate Champions, which a couple of us in the room have um, gladly been on. Um, and there's a, a huge amount of work that Hattie's looking into around retrofit and domestic retrofit at the moment. So catch her back catalogue with that. We then have Jack Richards from Additional Studio. Um, Additional Studio or a Manchester-based practice. Jack's got some of his models that he can explain a little bit more. Maybe you'll touch on it in this panel as well. And they also wrote this great, do you want to hold it up? This great piece about how to decarbonize your house now and different thinkings around that and different you know, uh, studies. So that's really, really great. And we've got Dane Middlehurst, who runs practice Pul um, Pulse and Middlehurst, but also has this wonderful organization called Home Notes. And that's all there to educate um, homeowners when they embark on doing some work in their homes, which can often be a bit of a daunting space to be, even if you have appointed an architect. So they've created all these wonderful little courses about how to navigate that whole space. Um, and there's going to be some exciting collaborations um, coming out beyond that in the retrofit space as well, which is great. And then finally, we've got Chris. Chris, Carew or Karis? Karis. <laughs> All, every time I talk about Chris to other people, I'm like, Chris Carew, you know, Chris Karis, Chris. <laughs> we know Chris. Chris runs um, Loco Home Retrofit in Glasgow, community-based retrofit delivery organization of wonder. Um, and we've um, crossed paths in lots of different ways in the retrofit space as well. But Essentially, all these people are doing great things around communicating this in the space to homeowners and clients. And so we thought it would be brilliant if we could bring them together. And um, yeah, we will just see where they take us for the next 45, 50 minutes kind of time. Okay, lovely. Give you that one. And I'm not sure why they're going to give you that one. Hello, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here. And now, Sarah, you've done the introduction, so Sorry. which is fantastic. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to say that yesterday, I, I arrived at lunchtime, but the way this, this discussion is really broadening the whole, the reach of retrofit and the, and the conversation around retrofit, including the kind of honesty of discussion you know, that we just had in the last session, I think is so important, and we just need to broaden that. But I wanted to get, before we start, I wanted to get a little bit of a sense of who's, who we've got here in the room. So I'm wondering how many people would call themselves community organizers, if you just put your hand up. OK, quite a few. Chris, you're not putting your hand up. <laughs> How many architects or former architects? Quite a lot, actually. Engineers? A few, a few. And who else? Uh, greeners, urban greeners, any urban greeners? I think that's such an important kind of world that often gets left out of this discussion and just as important in retrofit. Yeah, OK, none. All right. Well, lots of architects. Well, that's very relevant to the panel we've got now, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so let's see. Um, let me just get myself together. Um, I, I wanted to say one other thing on this topic of, of retrofit. Yesterday morning, I was at my um, yoga studio in London before I caught the train, and I saw one of the teachers I know whom I often chat to because her son is an architect, and I said, oh, I'm going to this retrofit festival in, in Birmingham. And she said, what? And, and I said, you know, retrofit, and she said, what is that? And I think, uh, you know, we still are struggling with that. And I think retrofit revolution sounds good. Retrofit reimagined sound good, but how we communicate this. And I think, you know, what Sasha was saying about telling it through telling your stories. I mean, the power of what Koje was saying yesterday is, is phenomenal, but I think we have a lot of, of work to do on that front. And I really like the other theme that came out yesterday is Emmy's message that there's a role for everyone in this. And I think for myself, you know, I've heard a number of people here say they kind of have come to this space recently in the last two or three years as climate emergency has ramped up. And I've been writing in this space for maybe 15 years now. And for so long, I felt like I was a lone voice talking to a wall and I had to fight for every 
inch of space and you know no one was listening and it's fantastic to see this kind of surge of awareness and I remember going to the first ACAN meeting and it's like why do we need another group and you know uh, I was wrong on that one <laughs> but um, actually in my list of who's here are there local people who just want to find out more about what this whole thing is I, I just uh, I think that's, you know, I really applaud the work of Civit Square and, and what you're doing. So, uh, I also just wanted to mention one thing that we've been working on at the Architects Journal, which many of you will know, and that this is um, masterminded by my colleague Will Hurst, is a retro first campaign. And I think that this has really, I mean, the, the premise of the retro first campaign is that before any building is demolished, you really need to scrutinize can it be reused, and if not, how much of it can be reused, and if it's going to be demolished, what happens to everything that's torn down, where does it go, how much of it can be avoided not to go to landfill. And I think this has really put this issue squarely in front of not just the profession, the architecture, the you know design professions, but the industry. It's been picked up in the broadsheets. And, the, you know, it's, it's really gotten traction. I mean, the biggest win so far is um, that uh, Marks and Spencer Oxford Street Edwardian store was proposed for demolition with a kind of anodyne 10 story building going up that targeting Bream Outstanding. And that has been uh, called in for review by Michael Gove, and, and who knows now, he's got other things to think about <laughs> what, what will happen. But the fact that, you know, it got to this point and we were able to stop that demolition and have that project reviewed is a huge, huge win. So that is the power of what can be done when you get out there and, and fight for something. Um, so now we're here to talk about domestic retrofit, and this is the thorniest topic of all. Uh, you know, I was talking to Chris earlier, and he said he thought this was kind of a technical topic when he launched into it, and he found out, no, this is a social topic, this is an everything topic, because as you said earlier, I think, Rosie, you know, it touches people's lives and their and their homes and I've I've been delving into this a little bit recently on my podcast so the first person I wanted to interview was Sarah I think Sarah deserves a huge round of applause for everything she's done to make today to make today happen and the second person I spoke to was John Christophers who's been on this journey for so long and welcomed us all to his home last night. I think another round of applause. <laughs> um, the, the current episode is with Jack. So if you want to hear more about from Jack after, after today, you can, you can have a listen. So we've given our, our little panel a title, Emerging Retrofit Practices, because these are kind of ways of going about it. And, um, We've got three people coming at this from really different angles. Chris in Glasgow, Jack in Manchester, and Jane, I would say, mostly on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And each speaker is going to talk for six to eight minutes, tell you a bit what they're up to. And then we're going to take questions from you. I hope you'll have lots of questions. And I've got a killer question in reserve. So uh, first, we're going to hear from Chris. And he is trying to jumpstart this in Glasgow almost single-handedly a bit what People Powered Retrofit is doing in Manchester. He's working small. He's working local. Um, one thing I have to tell you about Chris is that he completely retrained about four years ago. He was in, His background is in engineering, but he's been in manufacturing. He's been, I think you told me, selling toothpaste. Yeah. <laughs> and now... He's uh, done. The, he's got a master's in sustainable entrepreneurship. He's uh, trained, uh, got a passive house certification and AECB um, uh, carbon light program. So he's now deep into this space. So over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So local home retrofit, and um, we put ourselves forward as a community intermediary for for retrofit. And we're very much inspired by the work of Carbon Co-op in Manchester. Um, and the key idea is to try and stimulate both the market and the supply chain. And those two things have to be done together because the first barrier home owners or households run into, um, once they've you've marched them up the hill and they've got the money and the plan and everything organised, um, they can't find someone to do the work. So we, these two things need to come together. And that's the kind of the core of what we're trying to do. So um, like, 
if this afternoon I'm on a panel, if you want to hear more about how the organization developed, but I'll just talk more about what we're doing and, um, you know, the experience of dealing with, with households um, and how that's how that's going. Um, so there's three. Yeah, but just a little bit on that, just we, you know, it was a re, it was a career change just trying to find a more a greater purpose for <laughs> that sounds grandiose. But like my mom says, I am having a bit of a midlife crisis. You know, I mean, maybe she's right. Maybe she's right. But uh, I hit my 40s and like I'm sick of my job and felt like I wanted to do something more useful. So how can I get into um, climate action? Um, you know, went to the masters, found a niche which really addresses my interests in community development because I have ten years background as a community councillor in Glasgow. And um, how can we use um, like social approaches like that to address deep uh, climate uh, intractable problems? And home decarbonisation is, I think, the most difficult on a on a social level, or on, on a, pretty much any level really. Um, so two years, um, what, you know, the master's was in 2020 and the market research led us to this community intermediary model. Uh, a year of working up the courage to get started. And then uh, about a year ago, we, um, we incorporated as a community interest company. So an asset lock nonprofit. Um, but also we had Co-ops UK write the articles of association. So we're incorporated as, with the international cooperative principles baked in. So we're a membership organization and we're a uh, multi-stakeholder co-op, so that means, or multi-sided co-op. So we have household members, and we also invite, and we have less success in inviting tradespeople and construction professionals. So we have a number, a minority certainly, of um, contractors, so we've got a roofing contractor um, who wants to get into solar panels, um, and architects, um, retrofit assessors, retrofit um, coordinators, small number um charter surveyors and so on um so, so yeah so we're co-op and there's three things that we're doing um one is we want to like i said develop the market and um, so that's i'll speak more about that in a second but that's really about in speaking to households and helping them understand demystifying what it is and helping to build a community where there's peer peer-to-peer -peer learning the second thing is um an advice service so that's what basically funds my time um, and uh, again, I'll come back to that. And the third thing is um, we want to develop the supply chain. And we think the way we think we can get new supply chain entrants on a local community wealth building kind of basis is to persuade locally trusted joiners, builders, heating engineers, plumbers to come across from non-energy related uh, renovation, maintenance and improvement work into energy related retrofit. Um, through bulk buy, so uh, can we get even just 10 households together, they need the same kind of measure, the same kind of time, and the same kind of building, um, and would that be enough to de-risk the, the move across um, to, into energy efficiency registry uh, for, for those locally trusted people? Um, I say trust a lot, by the way, because trust is absolutely central. Like, retrofit is difficult, and difficult in terms of it's complex, knowing what to do, know what standard to aim for, it's um it's risky like you can make you can do serious harm to a building and to its occupants over time um so we want to avoid floor joist rotting and stuff like that um and uh it's expensive and it's disruptive and i think that the disruptive part of it is one of the biggest differences between the really good practices developing social housing and private housing and you can't just wait for the the occupants to move out and that you've got a void and then you do the one big bang you've got to think about stepwise retrofit and so on um so talking more about going back to the um like what we call the market development um which sounds like a very businessy term but essentially me and my co-founder are trying to create new work for ourselves um uh, better work which is better use of our time and our skills um and which addresses our social concerns about you know we want we think about non-profits and co-ops are really important because the alternative uh, economic models is for profit and perpetual growth and those are exactly the things that got us into this mess so we need um, uh, community wealth building and social social enterprise approaches. So the the way we develop the market to, to try and get ourselves this this work is um, first of all, you know, we've got like we have a membership. So we focus ourselves on the south side of Glasgow, which is an area of something like central south side, so maybe a hundred thousand um, people, fifty to hundred thousand is the kind of our core catchment, and. Um, but we don't talk about, like yesterday there was a lot of talk about street by street retrofit and contiguous projects in a street. We're just trying to find the people that are willing to take action or kind of 
motivated, they've got the headspace to think about it, they've got a bit of disposable uh, in, you know, income or budget savings, and they've got an opportunity. Usually they've be bought the property recently, or they... Um, or uh, you know they're planning some renovations or there's some kind of pivot in their life which means they need to make some changes like there's a, a baby on the way or they're thinking about starting a family or they've just retired and they want to get ready for retirement and so on um and um so that's that's the kind of the, the kind of catchment we're the geographical catchment that we're focused on and we started off with like just experimenting with methods like we're, i think carbon corp did a lot to pioneer in the uk which is um community-based social marketing um, and that's, you know, in-person events as much as possible. How am I doing? For, am I going too long? You've got two minutes. Cool. Uh, so community-based social marketing is all about in-person stuff, but we started this in the middle of the Omicron wave, and we just said, mm, we'll, we'll just do a webinar. Um, so we did quite a few webinars. We were lucky to get some really, uh, some, like, crowd pillars. Like, we have Lisa Pasquale, is a retrofit coordinator, is quite well-known on the national level. Um, in the UK and she lives locally and she did a case study about her flat so it really strongly resonated with people that live in those t kind of tenement flats in Glasgow and just demystified and um, yeah really kind of pivotal to have her involvement um, So how do you fund this Chris? I mean how do you, well, you said you had uh, figured out a way to pay for some of your time Yeah so the the, the paid service is um, is a uh, you know, I basically it's like one day a week. I, I I have a customer, and it's a whole day service. That's the paid service. It's three hundred fifty pounds for the day, and I offer my knowledge. One minute. Whoa. Uh, and um, my knowledge um, to 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 just demystify. I spent a whole day doing um, like a condition survey using the ACB checklist um a heat loss calculation a basic heat heat engineers heat loss calculation and um and then talk just spend a long time talking through what this all means they've people very often have just spent time on the internet battling against generic and conflicting information i just try and demystify it so mm -hmm. do i need can i get this uh weird solar pa no forget about the stupid solar thermal blah, 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 blah. just the options here are xyz mm -hmm. and realistically considering what the local authority is saying da, 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 this is what you should be thinking about and this is what's going to make the best use of your budget that you've said mm -hmm. you have and so on so that's that's the paid service but mostly over the last two years it's been savings i am in a position of privilege and i've used that privilege to fund this new endeavor um, and tr try to create employment point for myself and then soon i hope for other people Fantastic. Um, well, now we're going to hear from Jane. And I think one thing that's common to this to this um, panel, and it was very interesting because I think Dark Matter Labs framed this yesterday, and I hadn't really seen it framed quite this way in the many, many discussions about retrofit, is the kind of able-to-pay category of people. And I think, you know, as architects working in this space, you're most likely to be dealing with those who are able to pay and even in the work Chris is doing you're saying you need people who have a bit of budget and a bit of headspace to, to think about it but Jane has tapped into this market in a huge way she has almost 12,000 followers on Instagram who want to do something to their homes and figure out how to do it and I think you're pivoting now mm -hmm. to look more into the low carbon angle so tell us about your work okay so just to give you a bit of background to me I'm an architect who is teetering on not being an architect anymore. So I did residential architecture for 10 years, helping people at the very kind of uh, first step on the ladder to doing extension and, and home renovations. Um, and then we pivoted to um, provide online courses for those same uh, type of clients to navigate the process of renovating because we were finding that lots of people were coming to us with their extension jobs and they didn't have the budget to hire us for to have an architect for the whole surface from start to finish, which is what we were doing. And we were basically turning those people away and saying, good luck, <laughs> we, hope, we hope there's something out there for you, but feeling very kind of not comfortable with the world in which we were sending them out to. Um, it really felt like there wasn't a clear direction for those people on who was going to look after them and who was going to help them navigate 
who even to where to start the process and, and what type of extension or work that they were going to end up with. So that really kind of started the kernel of this idea that there was a place where we could actually, you know, rather on our exit kind of see you later, this is what I think you should do, actually make an online service that was available for everybody to help them way find and make a strategy for their renovation. So looking at their budget, um, looking at um, what they want to do to their home, and then helping them look at all the different options available to them and the different people that are out there in this sector and, and, make, and making sure they're choosing the right people for the type of job that they want to do. Um, and so it's very much about um, strategy and wayfinding and support. Um, so that, you know, that's how we started. Um, we have a, a series of courses that kind of support people at different ways, but then obviously we felt that there was a gap where I wanted the information to point people towards to say, you know, if you want to do insulation, if you want to retrofit, if you're looking for um, something in addition to the building regs, like where do they go? And I found that I didn't have that information to tell them. So that was start the start of my journey to kind of really um, work out what services were out there for homeowners that I could point them towards to make sure again that they were getting the, the service that was right for the thing that they wanted so to do. how long ago was that, that you felt the need to kind of... Probably about um, a year ago in earnest mm -hmm. that I was, you know, I've, I've always been interested, mm -hmm. um, but to the point of like, I need a name. I need a company mm -hmm. to, to pass this person on to, and I'm not actually sure who that person is. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously I, I came across a lot of great companies and you said re retrofit works and and just being here and, and hearing all the services that are on offer I feel there's a lot of things out there that that can be our are we making a new course which will kind of join on to the very beginning course which is making a strategy for their project that will help them um, specifically look at retrofit and build in to their team these additional people to take them where they want their project to go and also just raise awareness of the fact that this is something they can do and how to get people to get excited and um, understand the benefits of what building retrofit into their existing works is going to give them. Um, and I just thought it would be interesting to share today um, just a little bit, you know, obviously we speak to lots of um, home renovators um, in lots of different situations and just to share um, like a couple of different scenarios which I think is is interesting in the position they're in and, and the kind of issues they're facing. Um, so the first one would be that we came at this as architects and we actually saw this service when we started out as supporting people who were hiring architects for a full service architecture as well as these people who we were sending off who couldn't afford but it actually turns out that the vast majority of people are in this other category where they don't have that one person to take them from start to finish and be their kind of guide to take them through that process. They don't actually know that that's the position they're in because the the kind of language around architects and, you know, the fee proposals that people are getting do not make it clear whether they're hiring somebody for everything or whether they're actually just hiring somebody to do the exact thing that they've asked them, which is to draw the exact extension that they've asked for um, that meets planning and that meets building control. So um, we get a lot of people that are very confused about the service that they've hired and, and don't realize that they are actually the lead of their project. The majority of people are at the head in the kind of traditional architect's role and they are making all the decisions themselves and what they ask for they get delivered exactly there's nobody there saying have you thought about this let's look at the big picture maybe you want to think about doing this at the same time that advice just isn't there and it doesn't come to them so i see part of our role with those people is raising awareness of this as a, even an option um, because those people are paying for services and I guess from their perspective there's a lot of hoops to jump through so planning is very kind of stressful and nerve-wracking to get through and then they move on to building control and that is you know it seems like a 
a, a dark art. You know, their architects are saying, you can't do this, you can't do this. And once they've progressed through that, the concept of then going above and beyond that to open themselves to more questions and, and more things that they would add on top of what they actually have to add, they get to a point of overwhelm. And that's when they kind of, even if they're aware that that's something that they would like to do, they quite often retreat. Um, so I guess, you know, that first there's the awareness, second there's overwhelm, and I'm hoping that through, you know, having all these different people that can take them on the next stage of the journey that we can point them towards will kind of help them with that overwhelm and to make them understand that they are in this kind of lead role and that they are hiring all these different services and they have to pull that together. So just because their architect has given them this drawing, that architect is not capable or in a position to oversee somebody who's offering retrofit coordination, for example, that will come to them. So there's a lot of learning to do. Um, and then the other client, sorry, is one that minute, my timer? One minute. The other client, which I think is really, really interesting, is the person who is aware. Um, they know they want to do the works. They know that there are architects that are out there that can help them. And they might even be searching out architects who provide um, retrofit services. Um, and they're very up for getting involved in that. And then um, when they come to the prices, um, when they come to the value that they perceive that's going to be added, that's where they fall off. Because I think what's missing sometimes in the conversation is that a lot of people who are doing works to their home are not doing works to their forever home. People use renovation as a way to work up the housing chain. So people buy one bed flats and they see it as their method to ending up with a family home. So they might do two or three renovations before they settle for you know more than five years in a property. And when you're faced with thinking about your end goal, which is selling a property and being able to buy another property, if, the, um, if those extra things that you're doing to the house are not shown in your sale, you don't get the value back when you sell the house because they're not visible or they're confusing to homeowners mm. that you feel like you're adding an extra and we added an air source heat pump. What's an air source heat pump? You know, it doesn't make sense for them to do those changes, even though they're willing and able and they see the potential. Mm. Um, for me, there's, you know, obviously work to be done where we can do work at the beginning but there's also work where we need to get that work shown and get the value communicated at the point of sale mm. it needs to be we're talking about a mm -hmm. you know the 20-year plan for these houses mm -hmm. the plan has to stay with the house and not the people and each owner needs to be adding and working to adding that value, but it for it to be documented in some type of way so that they can pass that value on to the next person. That's really interesting. So just one question before we move to Jack, and I think Jack is a, this is a perfect segue into the work Jack's been doing. So how much do your courses cost, just to have an idea? Um, the Getting Started is the beginning course, and at the moment that's £195. Mm -hmm. So... You know, that is a lot of money mm. for somebody who doesn't have the money to do works. But I would say that the people that we're working with are doing extensions that are starting at 100,000, you know, 60 to 100,000 pounds mm -hmm. for the construction cost. Mm -hmm. So I would say as a proportion of that to like do that properly mm -hmm. and have a plan, that's OK. Um, but the retrofit aspect will be free because I want as many people to... I want to convince as many people on our course that this is something that they can add on. And I also just want that to be available to everybody. You know, I, that information needs to be out there and mm. we'd like to offer that, you know, to as many people as mm. possible. And how many different courses do you have going now? Oh, we have two. Um, and we all started and the site. So we ha we help people run site them themselves because quite often architect services finish before site right. and then they need support to kind of manage that process. Yeah. Okay. Super interesting. We'll have a look at Jane's Instagram because I think she's really onto something. And this is, we need, if we can get to these people, that's at least the start. Um, Jack, you're very much in the same space, but you've taken it in a different, kind of more bespoke direction. So, yes. So, I'm optimistically what's known in the profession as a young architect, and uh, 
if if you're sort of dissatisfied with the status quo and your circumstances allow as a young architect you can you tend to try and set up by yourself and that's what uh we did three years ago to try and do things differently and then on doing that you get to design people's kitchen extensions for 10 years <laughs> and and we thought well if we are going to do that me and my friend joe who i set up with we thought we're going to make sure that we really work with our clients to design these kitchen extensions to be the most sustainable the most um you know really 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 good for the you know, with our small bit of agency we try and do things well um and yeah well, our clients would be in we're based in in south manchester and our clients would you know they'd be the kind of people who shop at the organic co-op supermarket and they drive teslas and then they would commission huge very very thermally inefficient extensions on the back of their houses not because not because they didn't care about the environment evidently they'd made they'd made decisions in their lives to to be more to be more environmentally conscious but they they really had no um they, they they didn't really have any awareness of how their houses were impacting on the environment and the accumulative impact of all that work that's going on in individual projects so we found that we were really struggling we were we were i mean joe my business partner is is more argumentative than me and she was very willing to get into arguments with clients to try and persuade them that you know they needed to undertake retrofit works rather than putting in a, a uh you know bifold, huge bifold doors over the back of the house or or it was unwise to put in a put in a wood burning stove if you live on a road with a primary school on it for example um and what we wanted was we we wanted a kind of condensed version of all the amazing uh research and and guidance that exists for architects that we could give to our clients so that we could win those arguments essentially <laughs> and um we applied for some RIBA research funding which we got and we put together the guide decarbonize your house now um which tried to condense all yeah a huge amount of really technical really amazing um guidance but that's quite impenetrable so we 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 tried to simplify it and 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 boil it down so that if you were embarking on a project and as Hattie said it's the people who we're, we're always working with the people who have the money to spend on on they're about to spend yeah about 100 grand on their house and what we're trying to say is please try and spend it in a in a environmentally conscious way think about retrofit measures and think about in terms of the way in which you change your house think about doing that um in a in a low carbon way and um so, so in yeah so what we what we did with the research is we 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 made we made an exhibition in our studio which is an old shop so it has a kind of high street frontage so people can kind of walk in and come in come in and see the the exhibition uh we made three houses one which was the kind of typical um house extension that we get asked to design which is basically where a huge amount of the back of the house is removed lots and lots of steel is put in lots of concrete lots of glass and we and we calculated the um carbon emissions of that and then we made another model which looked at how you could do that looked at the kind of architectural potential um the design potential of how you could do that differently and anyone that was at the zero carbon house at any point over the last three days will know that it's that you know that kind of has done everything that we are trying to persuade our clients to do 15 years ago and it it is a bit you know that it you it's aesthetically a different proposition but there's so much creative potential and such an incredible character in in these um in these kind of materials and techniques um so that's kind of what we're trying to say with the second model and then the third model is a retrofit model so trying to explain to people what retrofit measures are um how they might look on your house and again like because i think our angle is very much like there's creative potential and there's aesthetic potential in these measures as well as health benefits and and thermal performance benefits and environmental benefits so trying to kind of um trying to bring clients on board with by saying you know um, um actually like render could be in a you, you could you could render your house in line render and it would actually look amazing like it would be a really beautiful thing rather than the kind of preconceived ideas which are um they've they've kind of seen some some sort of 
90s rendered council ex council houses that the renderings failed and they've re really stained and whatever and people are really worried about it but actually we're kind of saying you know there are good examples of this here they are this is how you can do it um and yeah so it more or less we've 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 had since we've started using it and we we made it kind of publicly available the guide uh you can download it on our website you can download it on the riba website we had lots of help from um acan and other architects to um kind of just read over and check that it made sense and there weren't any spelling mistakes and we weren't <laughs> we weren't saying things that were um you know very inadvisable um because i wouldn't say we're we're coming at it from a from any great expertise like we're we're um beginning our journey of, of becoming climate literate and climate advocates um so yeah and we've, we've been able to sort of persuade our clients quite successfully now to i think probably pro i think um, Joe was saying that we've got 10 domestic projects in the office at the moment and nine of them people are now undertaking some retrofit measures as part of the works that they're doing so I think what I would say is like architects are often the first port of call for the people with the money to spend on retrofit and if you and people are pretty receptive to the ideas if you can communicate them clearly to them um, and once those people are then empowered to to um kind of advocate for those sustainable measures themselves that's really great because as you were saying jane lots of lots of the time you're only involved so far as an architect and then we have a very entrenched way of building um so we were finding that often the builders were, were kind of having more control over what what was specified on our projects than we were but now if we can if if we kind of when we depart the project our clients are informed and educated and kind of advocating for those measures themselves we have a much better result of getting them implemented on site. Yeah, that's it's it's fantastic. So you can download, you can find this very easily. You can download it from Additional Studios website or can on the RIVA website if you Google it. Sorry, Hattie, can I just add? Yeah, I was going to ask you one more thing. Go ahead. <laughs> I bought the three models down from our shop, and they're just behind the there. So I'd like to, if anyone wants to come and talk to me, they'll be here till lunchtime, and I'd be very happy to explain oh, them to you. Fantastic. They're all made out of. Um, we went skip diving within a, a a mile of our studio and all the models are made out of reclaimed materials from skips around the studio so yeah i'd like yeah i'm very happy to chat to anyone thanks sorry one one of the things that i really like about this guide is it talks about trigger points so if you're going to do x think about doing y you know and this is what with this whole retrofit thing you know they're kind of points in time when you're going to be doing works on your house and if you're equipped and know what to do um you know now is the time and it just lays it out in a very clear way and what's interesting is that even with your own small practice with your own you know small pool of clients uh, equipped with this clients are feeling more able to balance how they want to spend their money rather than you having to go through one by one every single client and uh, re-educate them um i think it's it's really really interesting so sarah how much time do we actually have a... we have 15 minutes we'll be going about 15 minutes we might... okay so let's take some questions please introduce yourself My name is uh, Tim Weller from Hale Zion. Uh, I just want to encourage people with lots of money not to go for extensions, <laughs> not to go for a second or third home, because I think we need to live more simply. We need to live smaller. And if you've got pots of money, give it away to people <laughs> like um, Medicine Sans Frontier or UNICEF, to the poor. To those struggling please thank you thank you for that observation um is there yeah I, what i want to do is actually um what emmy had asked us yesterday as well is that it'd be good to hear from the women in the room as well um so do like step in if you feel oh yeah here we go am i allowed to pass this past the microphone or is that gonna let's see okay hi uh introduce hi, yourself everyone. Introduce it. <laughs> I'm Nidhi and I'm vice chair of AACB, which is Association of Environment Conscious Building, and uh, I have been a board member at AACB for 10 years. Uh, I 
also work for uh, Retrofit Action for Tomorrow in London and a raft which was started by Harry Patikas. You'll hear from me later on on my work. So, uh, I mean, the reason I raised my hand up was because we keep talking about whether retrofit is the right word or not, mm -hmm. or whether we should be using retrofit. And, and, and I think that retrofit has to become not retrofit, it is architecture reimagined because it has to become part of architecture. It has to become part of the profession. It has to become part of the uh, education. It's not an add on anymore. You know, it's like if we are going to decarbonize our world, we have to have an architecture reimagined. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will say one thing on that front. I think the schools are starting to get this and it has to start there. But yeah, that, I mean, and yeah. yeah. I'm going to go to Sasha and then I'll come to you, Paul. Paul, right? Yeah. Um, two things. I think, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, the one that said about uh, not um I think there is something in there about like some kind of pay it forward strategy with people who have loads of money to do this um I don't see why if it costs like 185 pounds to do your course for example and someone has a lot of money they could pay for someone who doesn't perhaps um so I think there's actually something there um and I'd really like to ask you all um if there's any organizing happening with the like with the builders building and construction industry, because I'd be really keen to hear more about that. Chris, do you want to speak to that? You're in trades people, working with trades people. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so taking the builders question. Um, yeah, so like we, okay, random thoughts. Um, we think community wealth building and taking an approach that brings in small, like micro traders, like micro enterprises, sole traders, is, is really important because for two reasons. One, there's just not enough big companies. Uh, in fact, more reasons than two. Uh, second, big national companies going street by street, by street doesn't address the huge trust issue about taking disruptive, invasive uh, measures in your home. And um, did I say there's just not enough people? Like, we just need everyone. So um, we, um, yeah, so I, we're really keen on trying to find ways for lo local builders to, to to get involved um it's just there's just huge hurdles for them to get the accreditations the training the risk involved for them on pricing these jobs that they've never done before it's just super super difficult do we, do you want to, mm. do we take each question in turn or do you want me to touch the other ones or? well i was going to ask jane do you think there's a could stand on legs the idea of you know someone paying for a course for you know having like the is it tom's shoes you every every pair you buy, you know one. I mean, yeah, that's a really great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. Um, yeah, I think there is. Um, it's funny that every every project, however big, is over budget. Yeah, <laughs> which is just, you know, it, it, it's just a it's a sad fact that what everybody wants to do, they can't afford what they want to do. Um, and I do think it is about, you know, I think that thing about not extending, and I know you've spoken about this, Jack, as well, like we often talk to people when their budget doesn't match what they want to do. It is a process of um, reevaluating the whys, like what, why do you want to, you know, that's part of the brief making process, like why do you want this? Is there another solution? You know, is there something you can do that's actually within your budget? Um, I, I think we rarely come across people that don't feel like they're scraping together money to do something to their house which i guess is the thing that is a slight barrier to that because they've already you know that it's kind of maybe when they get to the end of the process that would be a good time to pay it forward you know that they can pass on you know something you know after they've been through the process i think at the beginning they're just being told you don't have enough money again and again and and that would be an interesting thing but it would be interesting to know where in the process we can kind of get that pay it forward option yeah i think it's a great idea because i think everybody needs a strategy and mm. so many people who can't afford that still need mm. a strategy you know, mm. still need to understand yeah mm. more questions from the floor hi uh paul tester uh hem architects uh it wasn't wasn't really a question, it was more of an observation following from uh, Jane's point about the fact that they're going to make the retrofit information 
uh, or retrofit course free. Um, having been sort of in the low energy retrofit space for quite a while now, I came into it not particularly knowledgeable or skilled, and it's such a generous space. Jack and I were talking about this earlier. We share as much as we possibly can on, on, on our various platforms for free because that's the way that I learned. I haven't paid for very much training in this, but everybody in low energy, low carbon is so generous and we as an industry need this to become normal and not, we, you know, we could say we're carving out our niche at the moment, we want to protect that, but if we protect that niche, we're, we're going against what we're trying to do, I suppose. So that was just my observation. I just add to that. I think that's a um, really fair point. There's a lot of knowledge share going on and I think there's an arm being reached out into where that knowledge needs to go through that conduit of, of Jane um, and the work that she's doing. But actually, a little later on, there's going to be a skills panel and they'll be talking a little bit more about who's doing that work and who's making that available. And there's some really exciting things happening on that. So if you're interested in the skills bit, there's more on that soon. Great. Bobby? Yeah. Yes, but um, carrying on from what Paul just said there about, um, and it's just interesting there in the panel, you were talking about aesthetics. And as I guess they we weren't really commenting on aesthetics kind of stuff, but it is a big part of how we see and perceive and experience built environment issues. And it is meaningful, it's part of storytelling too. And I was just wondering, like, you know, do you think like there is obviously with aesthetics of green architecture, it's a lot of like, you know, putting trees on stuff or on big shiny buildings that might be energy um, can bad for the environment, but look good. And I was wondering, is there, do you feel like from your conversations you've had with people, say contractors or clients, do, do they have an aesthetic understanding of what retrofit look like? Or do you think it's really changing people's perceptions of what they want? Uh, I feel like we've spoken about this a little bit as well. I think, I think, just to go back to the zero carbon house, what was so in, invigorating about visiting it was this was to see all these kind of ideas brought together in one space. That 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 uh, it's very sustainable architecture, but it doesn't have the kind of, you know, it's it's still really like fantastic architecture. And I think, um, yeah, there's obviously the kind of like greenwashing approach and then there's also a very kind of um i wouldn't know how to describe it like i think, think i'd unfairly call it like crusty um, <laughs> approach which really kind of i think we find slightly turns people off and i think that what is exciting at the moment is that there there's a real opportunity to um to figure out what what the aesthetic of like low carbon architecture will be i mean i think it there's that's such a great example of it and it doesn't have to be really kind of um it doesn't it doesn't i suppose in some ways it doesn't have to be that different to what we've been what we have been doing but it it there are some fairly significant changes about the materials we're using and the way in which we're using them that that we really need to communicate to people and make really exciting for people because otherwise they're going to keep putting it people want you know like pinterest will will win over and people will keep putting in crystal doors that perform terribly and um huge amounts of steel etc 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 so yeah i think that's an amazing opportunity and i think the what yeah the fact that it that it there were so few examples of what that is at the moment is is should be what is really invigorating for the profession. I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you, and this is what I've been championing for so long, and and it's starting to happen. And I think one example is, and this might be heartening to some of you, that Jack and his shop and his studio shop front uh, client came in and walked in off the street that you didn't know, and you're now designing a, a house for them, which is quite amazing. And and it's worth looking at it. You can see some images on his website, also on my on my podcast. So can I say something yeah. like really I was just going to say that um like although it's it, you know like I I totally agree like it would be nice to see like what that actually looks like and to build like a, a demand for the way that that the way that those projects look different is aspirational I would say there's um a, a small danger in 
making um, a typology because people who want to renovate their homes see it as other. You know, there's a lot of people who are like, we don't want the architect because we don't want mm. their input, actually. Mm. We just want to get the extra space mm. and we just want to do this ourselves. And they're very nervous and apprehensive about architects and actually actively will tell us how amazing a garden designer was and what they did for them and say, but we didn't want an architect because we don't want them to like impose a style on us or, you know, we're not spending money on that or they think they're going to spend money on making it look a certain way. And so actually to make sure that that, that, that aesthetic is totally non, um, it's just totally different, you know, that, it, that there are so many different examples of what it is and not to kind of hone down on an aesthetic yeah. would be really no, good. I'm, unfortunately, we have a, a lot to overcome. Okay, so I think we, do I have time for one killer question? Yeah, so it, I wanted to ask each of you if, if there was one thing that could sort of jumpstart this retrofit revolution that we're talking about, do you, can you pinpoint something that you would like to see happen? Um, well, it seems I've got the mic. Uh, for me, it would be thinking about this, um, the plan and the acknowledgement that things have been done to the house in the same way that we can look up planning permissions that have happened to the house in the past. We need to have the whole house plan and the, the different things that have been done on that plan attached to the house so that everybody can see. So that it moves forward, yeah, with the next owner. Yeah. Um, Contrary, perhaps, to what was said before, I would think putting out assets like typologies and really specific guides for specific types of homes, I think, would be a big enabling factor. Uh, and making them open source, like we, we need to, there's just not enough time for everyone to create it all separately. So how can we make it, and not, you just need to get an abundance mentality, there's 27 million homes, and just, like, nobody in this room is a competitor. When there's 27 million homes, like any no business, two businesses is going to be competitive. You just need to forget that. So, uh, how can we put out assets for to make these things move faster? I think if we could, but like, turn our obsession with property in the country to our advantage, so that all programs like Homes Under the Hammer or or um, like the modern house website the evil estate agent if they were like uh <laughs> looking at things through looking you know everything was looking like so the person from the acv said if everything was um looked at through the lens of retrofit if that's the word that gets carried forward or that becomes the the way we we approach everything rather than on homes on the hamper like flipping properties and then if we could turn our the incredible amounts of value locked in our houses if people over the age of 55 could borrow against the huge amounts of equity they build up i think there's a lot of people who would spend their retirement doing incredible retrofits if they could borrow that money so and they'd be great clients so <laughs> great well thank you thank you thank you everybody thank Thanks. you organizers. thank you panelists